five of us, home on our first Christmas break from college, tumble down the steep steps at the village vanguard like we're the cherries in the whiskey sour of life. <laughs> Moments later, the small round table right in front of the stage is crowded with mixed drinks, rum and cokes, seven and sevens, and yes, whiskey sours. After a second round of drinks, Mose Allison steps up on the stage, places his fingers on the ivories, softly croons, your mind is on vacation and your mouth is working overtime. And so it goes. With the third round of drinks, the mouths of some middle-aged squares at the next table begin working overtime, loudly. Ray swings around and shushes them. They sneer like he's some kind of punk kid and go on talking. Two songs later, growling like someone's father, Michael tells them to shut the hell up. They don't. By the fifth round, Elaine hisses at them. The sixth, seventh, and eighth rounds appear and disappear. As you might guess, given my slightly elevated blood alcohol level at the time, I am only guessing that Jane is 11 whiskey sours in when she leans her head on my shoulder, turns her cheek onto my chest, and I feel a warm wetness from nipples to crotch a pool of partially digested maraschino cherries and orange slices in my lap. <laughs> that is not all. <laughs> Michael sees Jane, gags, stands up, and barfs on the table. <laughs> that is not all. <laughs> Elaine watches Michael Wretch, blows up her cheeks, and runs to the bathroom projectile vomiting the <laughs> length of that small, dark jazz club. And yes, that is not all. After everything is mopped, swabbed, sanitized, and we are asked to leave, I realize Jane has disappeared. I find her in the ladies' room, on the toilet, leaning against the stall spittle running down her chin. And right, that is not all. Bunched at her ankles are sus pants, girdle underpants that even young and thin girls wear to keep things from jiggling. I consider removing them, but even I know that bringing a girl home without her underpants is a bad idea. <laughs> so I pull up my semi-comatose girlfriend, drape her arms over my shoulders an inch, an inch, and inch the girdle up over her calves, her knees, her thighs, and up, up, up over her bottom. Then I kneel, bend her over my shoulder, stand, and wobble nonchalantly through the club, <laughs> up the steep steps, and over to my father's Chevy station wagon on Perry Street. Of course, that is not all. <laughs> With our friends safely back in their suburban homes, Ray and I are parked in front of Jane's house, discussing the best way to return the inebriated girl to her parents. <laughs> One of us, I don't recall who, suggests we install her between the storm and front doors. <laughs> ring, the, ring the bell and run. <laughs> we both think that's hysterical. But when some divine sobriety appears, we walk the wobbling girl up the flagstone path, ring the bell, and tell mom 
that although we warned Jane about the dangers of drinking too much, <laughs> she just hadn't listened. And because every story has another story lurking in the shadows, even that is not all. The following morning, as I stumble bleary-eyed down the stairs at home, my mother looks up and asks brightly, you kids have fun? <laughs> this is a month before she will learn that I am on academic probation for my 1.7 GPA. <laughs> two months before my long hair and beard will have obscured what she calls my boyish good looks, three months before I will inform my parents that they and their suburban friends are bourgeois capitalist pigs. <laughs> But this is now. So with my best Eddie Haskell smile, I say, life is a bowl of cherries, mom. And she smiles back knowing in her heart that her kid really is all right. <laughs>